to this uh, first session this afternoon. Uh, most of you will have met or know Dave Chinner, or know of him at least. He's been the XFS maintainer for I don't know how long. Uh, today he's going to be talking about how XFS has been developing and changing and learning new tricks. Dave, over to you. Oh, thank you for all coming along. I see the uh, troublemakers are evenly distributed around the room. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so feel free to heckle at any time. I don't mind if you have any questions as I go along. Um, I'll try and answer them quickly. If not, we can defer it to the, the end. Uh, so without uh, further ado, um, I'm here to talk about XFS. I've talked about all sorts of other things in the past few years, but not XFS. So it's about time I did this again. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the new functionality that we have in XFS and some of the things I'm trying to do with it that are a bit different or more of the same, things that shouldn't be able to do, but I think we can. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick uh, overview of the XFS architecture, a um, couple of minutes, uh, same with copy on write file systems. I'm not going to talk about any specific file system um, in that case, but just the generic algorithms. Uh, and then how copy on write and XFS differs from those file systems. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to try and look at some of the functionality that we can't directly support and how we might be able to rethink that functionality and in doing so provide some new tricks for an old dog. So XFS architecture, um, the best way of thinking of XFS is that it's the original B-tree file system. All its metadata is indexed in B-trees, everything is a B-tree. Um, they're not a traditional B tree, they're more a B star tree. Uh, the difference being that they have sibling pointers in each node and each leaf. So we can do horizontal traversals across the tree. Uh, that becomes important when we start considering things like copy on write, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, it's split into allocation groups, which are like mini file systems in themselves, and they have their own free space index B trees, their own inode B trees reverse mapping B trees and extent reference count B trees. All of your file data is referenced by extents that are held in B trees. Um, they span uh, allocation groups so can index the entire file system. Directories and attributes, they're more B trees. Um, the directory tree is actually the most complex one. It's a virtually mapped uh, multiple index B tree uh, with all sorts of hashing and things like that to actually make them scale. Uh, way outside the scope of this talk, um, but very complex. Uh, we use write-ahead journaling um, rather than copy on write for, for crash resiliency and recovery. Um, and we use checkpoints for reducing the write amplification of the journaling process as we remodify, you know, blocks that have already been journaled. So that's the overview of that. Um, a similar very fast overview of copy on write file systems. The key thing about those is that effectively they can write anywhere in the file system. Uh, but by doing that, um, writing anywhere, it's a side effect of the way they update. Uh, when we modify a block in or modify anything in a copy on write file system, we actually take a copy of it. Uh, and in doing so, we have to update all the pointers to that metadata or data. Uh, so we have to update its parents, and that requires modif modifying them. And so then we have to update everything that points to that, and then we have to modify and update and modify and update. And we do that all the way back up to the tree root uh, until we've got a whole new uh, unique file system index from leaf to tip. And so when we go to write that out, uh, we write out the whole tree. That's the copy on write part of it. Uh, so. We can write that anywhere, so we can optimise and linearise all the writes, and it gives us lots of performance benefits to do that. Uh, it also gives us consistent on-disk uh, images, because we can write the entire tree, or the entire new tree, before we swap the root index, the active root index. And we can do that with an atomic I.O. So essentially, a copy on write file system should always be consistent on disk, which is great for crash recovery. Um, the downside of this is it requires space allocation on disk updates. 
and that requires modifying metadata, which means we have to do a metadata tree update, which means we need to allocate more space for all of that stuff that we just modified. And so that leads to the problem that we don't know exactly how much space a copy on write operation is going to require to write to disk. And that leads to other problems in the future. So while we're talking about the index trees being updated, these are the mechanisms that provide the functionality that we associate with copy on write file systems, uh, sharing, uh, snapshots, subvolumes, and so on. They're all really uh, a natural extension of having an index tree structure that references, you know, has reference counts to objects, so enabling us to have multiple indexes to a single object. And therefore, if something hasn't changed and we've written a new tree, it's just got another reference to it. Snapshots in themselves are really just a superseded uh, tree. When we do an update and write the new tree out and point to it. If we leave that index tree that was the old one in place, that's effectively a snapshot. And if we want to keep it around as a snapshot, then we just need to take a reference to that tree. And if we don't, we can leave it to the garbage collection to clean up and the space gets freed. Uh, replication um, of snapshots, it's basically replicating the tree index and everything that it uh, references and points to, so all of the objects in that tree. Uh, that means that the replication needs to know about the tree structure, all the object types, uh, things like reference counts and so on, and it becomes quite complex. Um, but it does give us the send-receive style uh, replication that we have, and you, you're all familiar with and know about. So copy and write in XFS is a bit different. Um, because of the B star structure, the sibling pointers in B trees, we can't do copy on write B trees. Because if we were to modify a block in a B tree, uh, not only do we have to up update the parent, we also have to update the siblings that point to us. And because we've updated the siblings, we then have to update their parents and the siblings that point to them. And so <coughs> instead of it just being a leaf to tip update, we now have to move horizontally and we take everything in that B tree from there upwards and have to rewrite it. And so if we're re writing a, a leaf, which most of the B tree updates do because that's where we store all the records, um, it become, a modification becomes an entire tree rewrite. And in the worst case, uh, we end up having to rewrite the entire file system. Not good. So basically we're limited to doing data only copy on write. Uh, and that limits the functionality that we can provide to things like file cloning and data deduplication. Um, there's a lot of people that want this sort of thing and can make use of it. Uh, OverlayFS is now using file cloning to optimise its copy up processes and so on. Uh, the NFS server is capable of doing copy offload via uh, data sharing. And there's a bunch of things that can be accelerated via cloning rather than copying. Um, the advantage of it being data only is that there's no impact on non-shared data and no impact on metadata because we're not doing copy on write on any of them. Uh, we're just rewriting in place. And so it behaves exactly as though we didn't ever do this. Um, it also means we always have space available for the modification because we know how much we're overwriting and we only need to allocate data space for that because the update of all of the metadata is written in place. And so we don't have the chicken and egg problem of how much space do we need to update the metadata uh, problem. But with journaling, it becomes a little bit more difficult to provide cr crash resistance um, or resiliency um, because we're not writing a tree and then updating. Uh, so what we've implemented is a thing called a deferred operation. We've pretty much formalised an intent logging mechanism in the journal. We used this for freeing extents uh, previously, but now we've extended it to doing reference count updates and reverse mapping B-tree updates and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and so we can actually replay the, uh, the copy on write updates um, and extent sharing updates and things like that in log recovery when we find intents that haven't been completed. So now you know the, how it's different and what we, uh, 
what we can do in XFS, what stuff can we actually really do with data copy on write? Uh, everybody wants a file system that does sub-volume snapshots, uh, you know, it sings, it dances, it jumps around and does everything that you want. Um, but we keep getting stuck on the fact that that sort of advanced functionality tends to require copy on write metadata and we don't have that. So how do we, how do we re, repackage this problem um, into a way that we can see a different way of implementing this functionality? Uh, that's the ultimate goal is to be able to do this sort of stuff. And so how much of a file system do we actually need for a subvolume? to implement something that looks like a subvolume, that smells like a subvolume, that behaves like one. How much do we need? We've got other implementations. What do they teach us? What should we avoid? What do they do right? Is there something we can steal from them or copy? Because that's the easy way. <clears throat> we don't want to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. Um, and that requires thinking about it in more depth. And going back to first principles, um, you know, we want to have a subvolume, but really, what is a subvolume? What does it provide? What makes it a subvolume? Well, I came up with three things that I think make up a subvolume, that define a subvolume. A subvolume has flexible capacity. Uh, you can grow and shrink it without any impact. It happens instantly. Um, the space comes from the underlying pool that's providing your storage. Um, and as long as there's free space in the subvolume, you can shrink it down. Or you can grow it out to the size of the pool, and in some cases, to larger than the size of the pool, which you know, some people want to do. But it's flexible. They're also a fully functioning file system. You know, you can treat it as though it's just a file system. You can, you can do everything that you can do in a file system. You can allocate space. You can punch holes out of it. You can, you know, copy stuff around and around. You can move them. You can clone files within them and so on. They just behave like a fully functioning file system. You don't notice any difference. But I think the thing that actually makes a subvolume, a subvolume, is that it's the unit of granularity of a snapshot. You can snapshot a subvolume independently of the rest of the hierarchy of the file system. It's an independent entity uh, in that manner. And so when we look at those three rules, that pretty much, or those three items, it pretty much encapsulates the functionality the subvolume provides us with. Everything else is built on top of these, these, these three things. And so now with that defined, I sort of think, okay, so how much of a file system do we actually need to provide this functionality? Can we look at it as a namespace construct that sits above the file system, that maybe through VFS functionality, a bind mount, for example, people use those to make, you know, directories and for containers, uh, mount namespaces, things like that. They're already there in the VFS. And can we make something that looks like and smells like a subvolume out of that? And so we can sort of do that with a bind mount and then we throw a directory hierarchy quota on top of that and now we have flexible space management for that directory subtree. That's starting to smell like a subvolume. And we can sort of, you know, if we squint hard enough, we can say we can snapshot it. Yeah, sure, uh, uh, a recursive CP that's doing data cloning still replicates the metadata, but the vast majority of the structure has been cloned. It's been reflinked. Um, and so we're not actually copying the data. It's, like I said, if you squint hard enough, it's a snapshot. So now we have a good proportion of the functionality that we actually want, but we haven't done anything with metadata cloning. We can do replication, <coughs> it's sure it's slow, but rsync and tar and things like that, we've got tools to do that sort of stuff. It doesn't look like something like a ButterFS subvolume, it doesn't smell like one, but when you look at the functionality, it's kind of similar. 
And also at the namespace level, we have functionality like overlay. It's a shared sub-volume, the lower directory. And then we have a writable overlay sitting on top of it. OverlayFS is a copy on write namespace construct. It copies data and replicates metadata as you modify what it presents to you. And so what overlay tells us here is that you can provide something that looks like a subvolume using data only copy on write and metadata replication. Uh, it's instructive to look at it like this because it gives us different insight into the functionality. You know, what is a subvolume? How much do we need to implement? We can see it that it's not your traditional subvolume, but it's kind of the same thing. And so now that we've looked at what we can do above the file system, can we do the same thought experiment below the file system? So perhaps a subvolume as a device construct. Um, well, we can. Everybody knows how to do this and have probably done it in the past. You use a loopback device. You create a file, put a, as a, you know, put, format it with a file system. So you've now got a file system image and you mount it via loopback. There we have, essentially, a subvolume implementation. We, I can say that with a straight face because we can clone it with data-only cow. It's a simple process. We've got snapshots. We've got somewhat flexible space management. We're still limited to what the block device layer can provide us with and what the file systems themselves implement, but it could be flexible. Replication, well, it's just copying files. They're, they're image files. Everybody knows how to deal with them. You know, you're probably running your VMs or you know, sometimes containers and things like that based on this structure. But what it's starting to show is that what we think of as a subvolume, we're already using, and we're using them in different ways that you're not really associating as subvolumes. So the problem with loopback devices is that uh, when the file system hosting the, the file system image runs out of space and you write to the upper file system, it doesn't write. Lower file system tries to allocate blocks. It's uh, got no space, you know, space. Upper file system goes, oh, I didn't expect that error. Blammo. <laughs> this has all the problems of thin devices. Uh, and it's actually worse than the copy on write file system you know, space problem. Uh, because it happens unexpectedly. You can't predict it. And when it does happen, you can't recover from it. It's a really nasty corner case. So, it shows us things that we want to avoid. And that brings us on to learning from others. What have others done that works and what have they done that doesn't work? Well, Overlay and to a lesser extent ButterFS have taught us that specifying subvolumes and the way the devices are constructed by mount options is really, really clunky. Uh, having to pass overlay three separate directory structures via mount options to mount it and get it to work is clunky. Um, we'd like to avoid that sort of thing. ButterFS requires a subvolume ID as a mount option to mount a subvolume. It's a similar sort of problem. Um, and that's not really ideal because you have to think about it. You have to specify what you want in a mount option as opposed to as a primary you know, mount control. Uh, it's clunky. We have the problem with, uh, with ButterFS that it has a shared super block. And that means that there's certain things that don't quite work properly, like all of the subvolumes have the same device ID. And so when you tell Find to pass over a file system and not go into any other device, it can't find subvolumes. And so there's issues like that. They're little subtle problems, but can cause issues with things like backup programs and other stuff that might need to, might use this sort of information to limit searches and whatnot. It's all very subtle, but the problems are there. And there's other problems inside the kernel with this sort of structure. Um, so 
what we've learnt is that uh, subvolume really needs to be an independent VFS entity. It needs to act like a fully functioning file system and not something, well, not only needs to act like one, needs to be implemented like one because there's only so much that you can hide by lying. I've already gone through the object-based replication problem with tree replication. Um, both sides need to know about the tree structure and all the object references and whether they need to be copied or, or whatnot. Um, I won't go that, into that in any more detail. And we know that Eno space is a problem um, from our thought experiment as a device construct or from the problems that copy on write file systems already have at Eno space. Um, It means we've kind of got to think about Eno space as the first problem that we need to solve in our new architecture. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we need communication between layers. We've got Eno space occurring because the upper and lower volumes, whatever they are, have two different ideas of what, how much free space there is and there's no communication between them. And so when they get it wrong, uh, things go very bad. Uh, we've talked about this for a long time in venues like LSFMM, um, the DM developers, the file system developers, but we've never really made any progress on it because nobody, especially on the file system side, has had any clue about what needs to be done to a file system to implement the necessary accounting for between the shared layers. But a while back, Christoph Helwig Im implemented a file layout uh, PNFS uh, implementation for XFS, for the PNFS server, which allowed the PNFS client to essentially remotely map files out of the server file system. You know, the client says, I need to do a read, and it asks the server, where are those blocks? and the server passes the block mappings back and the device that they belong to, and the PNFS client goes and does the read I.O. from where they come from without going through the, the NFS server. There's also a block allocation mechanism in there, and so we've basically got a situation where the PNFS client is doing file system allocation on the server and then doing all its I.O. to somewhere else. Uh, so we have a model there for cross-layer communication of space accounting and I.O. mapping and so on. And this is very instructive because it gives us a mechanism, it shows that we can use mechanisms for uh, accounting and controlling allocation and space management between the different layers. And if we do that, there's a, an interesting thing here. I've gone one too far, haven't I? Um, ah, looked at the wrong slide. So, a new type of subvolume is really what we're kind of thinking. It's a different construct. It looks and smells the same as what we think of a subvolume, but the design and implementation <coughs> is very different. And we have to do this because we don't have copy on write metadata. We can't use the traditional structure to provide the functionality that we want. We know from the thought experiment of the block devices, we can use image files. So what say we allow the kernel to directly mount image files rather than block devices? No reason why we can't do that. If we add a device space management API to allow communication between the layers, we then have the, the space accounting and allocation and remapping sort it out. If the file system implements both sides of the API, we can use image files hosted in a file system to provide a subvolume of that same file system type. And we can allow the subvolumes then to remap from the image file, not knowing what device underlies it or whether it's even an image file, and they do their I.O. based on the mapping information that is returned from the underlying layer. So they operate independently and without knowing what block device they sit on. So we've basically broken 
the file system block device uh, requirement. To get this to work, I've had to remove the FS requires BDEV flag from XFS because we're not using block devices anymore. We can mount files. But the good thing about this is that it also works on block devices. So if you have a, a thinly provisioned block device, such as DM ThinP, if it implements the host side of the API, we can treat those block devices as though they're file system subvolumes. They're file systems in their own right sitting on a block device. But because there's now, from a file system perspective, no difference between a file system on a block device and a subvolume on something that provides IO remapping and allocation, we can do this. It basically looks the same thing, but the advantage of it is, is that the block device is going to give us Eno space before we start any modifications because we've said we need this amount of space to do this modification and it's turned around and said, I don't have that space. We can gracefully return Eno space to user space rather than 30 seconds down the track when we write the metadata back going, oh, we've got Eno space, oh, kablamo. Uh, it's, it, it will actually work. But that's kind of a, a bonus, a side issue from what I'm talking about here. It solves two problems at once. And to me, that means I'm probably on the right track here if I can solve multiple problems with the one set of changes. So if we go back to file images on a file system, you know, we've got to be able to do snapshots. Snapshots are actually really easy in this model. We simply freeze the subvolume, which we can already do because it's a fully functioning VFS entity, uh, and we then clone the image file, which we only need data copy on write to do. So XFS has this capability. With a subvolume of this type, we don't need to implement copy on write metadata to be able to snapshot clone our file systems, our subvolumes. It's fast and it's efficient, and the thing that we see here is that by doing the copy on write at the host file level, we're actually providing the subvolume with copy on write metadata without it having to implement copy on write metadata itself because the copy on write happens at the layer below. And all that needs to do is say, I'm going to write this many blocks and the underlying file systems say, yes, you can or no, you can't. It doesn't need to know that the underlying blocks uh, copy on write, but it so supports that type of functionality. So the end result is that we have copy on write metadata in the subvolume without having implemented it in any file system. Replication could be done just by copying the image files. We can do better than that. We can map the image files and work out which blocks in the image files have changed between two snapshots. I wrote a prototype of this based on loopback devices using sparse image files. Uh, it was about 200 lines of uh, bash, sed, orc, and XFSIO commands. Um, it's actually really simple, and it requires no knowledge of what's actually in the files. It's basically a delta copy, and it's basic and straightforward. We don't have to know anything about the file system image. If you've got a snapshot of two ext4 file system, this same piece of code will work. It, it's completely independent of what's inside the file system image that you're actually snapshotting. So it's generic functionality. I'm not sure that ext4 is ever going to do this stuff, but if they do, they can make use of our tools. Yeah, that's a good thing. Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. But now that we've got this, what else can we add on top of it that is going to be useful to us? What do people actually need from their subvolumes that they don't currently provide? ButterFS doesn't provide, ZFS doesn't provide. Um, there are things that the people are asking for that we can actually do and we only need data copy on write to actually implement. So the first one is case sharing between subvolumes. 
If you've got a container system and you have 500 containers mounted and they're all based on the same original golden image, you can put that on Butterfess and snapshot it as many times as you want, as many times as you need, but when you then go and start up all the containers, they all operate independently, they all cache their own versions of the files within the subvolume. There's no case sharing, so you have 500 copies of bin bash in memory. It's highly inefficient um, and that causes problems because you, know, you want the memory for the containers not to cache 500 copies of you know, bin bash. Uh, overlay does this right. Those 500 copies of, or 500 cloned images, they're still using the one base image or one base directory hierarchy, the read-only shared volume at the bottom. So it only has one copy of all of these unmodified files in the file system and in memory. And so they're shared between all 500 containers. That's what we want to do. And that means we have to be able to share extents in, uh, share data in shared extents in the page case. It's complex and difficult because the Linux page cache is a logically indexed page cache. It's indexed by file and offset into the file, whereas the only information we have about the, uh, the shared extents is their physical location in the file system, the block number. And so to do a lookup to find a shared page on a shared extent, either we have to do an exhaustive search of all of the inodes that might have it cached, so we have to look it up in the reverse map B tree, find all the other owners, then look to see whether those inodes are in the cache, then if they are in the cache, look to see whether they've got the file at that off, the page at that offset is cached, and if it is, then we can take a copy of it and insert it into the new file. Or we can put a buffer cache in place, and when we see a shared, uh, shared extent at block X, we do a look up in the buffer cache for anything at block X, and if it's there, we take a reference to the page and insert it into the page cache. It's a single operation as opposed to an exhaustive search. It's much faster. XFS already has a buffer cache that we can use for doing this. All of our metadata is held in buffers and indexed by block number. So we already have a scalable buffer cache in XFS. The problem is, is that we don't have a mechanism for sharing pages between multiple files. Um, so that's, that's Matthew's problem. <coughs> uh, he'll fix that for me, and so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> well, not yeah, he, yeah, maybe next week. week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so the thing is, we get functionality over on top of functionality that is being provided by subvolumes at this point in time, um, and this is where we start to provide extra value and in relatively simple manner. Now. This also might be something that people are interested in. Um, a couple of months ago, people were telling me, oh, no, we don't need encryption of, sub uh, encryption of containers and subvolumes and stuff like that. We've got all the isolation we need already. <laughs> and then there was a couple of exploits that broke all the isolation of VMs and containers <laughs> and so on. And so I'm suspecting that people are going to want to put a few more <coughs> layers of defence in to make it harder to... You know, when the isolation is broken, to make it harder to, you know, steal somebody else's data. Um, and so, by implementing the generic VFS file encryption infrastructure into XFS, like is already in ext4 and f2fs and ubfs, and I think there's one other coming along at the moment, um, by implementing <laughs> that, um, we gain per file encryption keys. Uh, and that then feeds into the fact that we could either encrypt the image files at the layer below the subvolume, or we can encrypt the files at, by, the user can encrypt the files from inside the subvolume. Or we could do a mix and match of both. Uh, we might be able to do smart things by integrating some of the key management into the uh, device space remapping API. And so we can, it, it's looking very much like we can actually provide encrypted, snapshotable, cloned subvolumes with these mechanisms. There's still a lot of work to do to get there, but this is the sort of thing that we're looking at adding into this functionality. So, as I said, 
there's still a lot of work to do. We're only at early stages. Um, the management interface that we present to users is not locked down. We really haven't spent a lot of time discussing this very much at all. And that's because we don't need to worry about what the management interface is while we're getting the technology uh, sorted out. Uh, we've got to have the mechanism in place before we worry about how people are going to manage the policy. Um, you know, how do we present the host volume? Uh, is everything a sub-volume? Uh, so does the host volume have sub-volumes that it automatically mounts one of them like Butterfest does? Or is it a file system in its own right that we hide the sub-volume images somewhere that so users can't RM-RF them? Um, which is kind of bad thing to do. Uh, we need to think about abstractions for other uh, management interfaces, uh, distro installers like Anaconda, um, uh, you know, Docker is going to need to know how to do all of this stuff. Um, you know, there's a bunch of things like that that uh, we need to consider that we, is just way above the scope of what we're looking at at this point. Um, that comes once we have stuff that we can actually work and test and, and does what we need. So the interfaces that we're putting in place at the moment are what we need to do to integrate into our, our uh, test infrastructure to make sure this all works. Um, None of this code has seen any review um, yet. It's still basically mostly on my laptop and on the servers at home. Um, so there's going to be lots of discussion of the APIs and the, the, the various bits of code that I need to push into the kernel outside of XFS, let alone all the stuff in XFS itself. Um, so there's probably going to be a few flame wars around that, a bit of shouting, um, all the usual melodrama that goes along with it, doing controversial things. Um, so that should be a bit of fun to, you know, grab some popcorn, sit around, you know, have some fun. And of course, I mean, there's still lots and lots of code to write. Um, so at this point, you're probably wondering, oh, so why are you actually talking about it? You know, you know show us the code. You've said you've got some. Okay. So... <laughs> All right, if you insist. Okay, so I am going to, I've done all the requisite sacrifices, and so what I'm about to do is uh, try and run a sort of scripted, um, there we are, no, I have it there, a sort of scripted demo of what we can actually do. So, can where, uh, hold on, can I? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that might work, but who knows? There we are. Is that big enough? How is that? A bit more would be nice. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. So basically, I've scripted all the commands because if I type them, it will take much longer. And now all I have to do is talk and press enter. All right. So first of all, we need to make the underlying file system. It has to have reflink enabled. That's the data cow. Um, so it goes off and makes it, and so on. Now, that's already mounted. Um, that's behind the scenes. Now I want to create a, uh, a, a sub-volume. We're going to call it Blamo because there's every chance that this is going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's a demo. Um, it's one gig in size, and the volume, the, the underlying host is mounted on slash mount. So off it goes, and it makes it and runs MakerFest. So it's created the file in the, in the, the repository, and if we list it, we can see that we have a sub-volume named Blamo. Now, you might notice that the size are a bit strange. I said one gigabyte, didn't I? Well, there's a couple of things here. Oh, that hasn't shown up. Oh. All right, I'll come back to that in a moment. OK, so it's there, it's four gig in size, oh, underlying file is four gig in size, and it's using 208 megabytes to host all of the metadata that was in that file system. These are all very simple things to get numbers for a demonstration, and that's about it. So now, to mount it, we basically tell it that it's an XFS subvol. We're using sub, subtypes that the mount command actually used, and we're passing it the file that the file, file image is in. We're not passing it a device or anything of the sort like that. And so we go and mount it. It goes and mounts. It, you can see we've got three inodes. So that's the root inode the, uh, the, the, and the real-time device inodes that have been pre-allocated by MakerFS. Uh, we've done a, created six, six directories, touched five, five zero-length files in them because we don't have data cow yet. Uh, oh, sorry, the data path has not been done yet, so I'm not 
demonstrating that. So if I list that, we can see that we've now got 33 inodes in there and there's 33 meg of used space. So here we have it reporting that it's almost a gig in size and, and so on. So the file system here is actually, or you know, the, the subvolume is reporting the correct size, not what the, uh, the list command was actually reporting. So you can see that it's coming up correctly. So now we can snapshot it as it's mounted. And so it's found the subvolume file. It's now snapshotted. It's added dash ss0 as the first snapshot of that file. Um, we can clone it as well. So let's clone it because we're going to write it. This might go kaboom. Um, so we're going to call this one kaboom. And so we've cloned the image file into kaboom. So if we list the subvolumes now, so that's actually cloned it, done all the work that's needed to, to mount it, and I'll mount it in a sec. But so now we see we have a snapshot called Blamo SS0, and you can see that it's much smaller than the original. And that's because it's ref-linked. You know, it, it, we're using data copy, and in snapshotting it and mounting it and making all those things, we wrote some new data. And so that's what, there's 141 meg of data that's different to that one there. Um, and then we cloned it again into Blamo, and that's why it sits at 141. So now we'll mount Kaboom, and we'll touch A, B, C, D, E, and F. So another 30 files in there. The other ones were 0 to 5. Um, I just did that so you could see that there's 0 to 5 and A to F. And so basically the subvolume that was there that we cloned has already got that information in it. And so let's go back to Blamo, which should only have 0 to 5 in it because it was the source that we cloned it from, and it should still only have 0 to 5 in it. Yeah. And it does. So we've just done a copy on write snapshot, a copy on write clone, modified the clone, and we see that that modification hasn't appeared in the original source. And so once we've got that, we can go and snapshot the, the, the clone. And let's snapshot it again just for the, 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 the fun of it. And so we can see now that the clone, Kaboom, has got more space usage in it than the original snapshot because we've added more modifications to it. It's done copy on write, allocated more space, and so it's got more used space in it. So that's basically copy on write subvolumes, snapshots, and clones in XFS using data-only copy-on-write in infrastructure. And we can just also remove them at all, also, you know, remove a snapshot, you know, yeah, that went, went away, so we've now only got one snapshot and the original device. We can remove them all in one go, so get rid of all the snapshots and the underlying one. So Kaboom is gone, and so now we've only got Blamo and, and the snapshot. We can remove the original device, leaving the snapshot behind. So there it is there. Uh, and uh, you know, we can remove that as well just by saying remove snapshot ID 0. And so now there's nothing left. We've just emptied everything completely out. Why, why didn't the amount of space used by Blamo's snapshot go up when you removed Blamo? What's that? Why didn't the amount of space used by Blamo's snapshot go up when you removed because the accounting is very, very silly in this code, in the, in the user space code. Just repeat the question for the camera. Ah, the, the question was when I removed the, uh, the, the, when I removed Blamo, why didn't the space usage in the snapshot go up? And that was because I'm using something very silly to actually put those numbers there. Like I said, um, they're numbers just for the purpose of showing things change um, and nothing else. Um, just to, so you can see that it was actually mounting things. This is coming out of D message. Uh, we have reverse mapping and reflink enabled. We have the thin space management enabled. Uh, so that's a new feature. And we also have the sub volume feature enabled on these things. Um, and so you can see that we had two different sub volume mount, mounted. We have 38 and 39. So there were two subvolumes being mounted. And so at this point, you've seen all I, you've heard all I've got to say and heard uh, here we go. I need to bring that back down here, I think. Oh, it's not going to work, is it? <laughs> there we are. Oh, and it's gone back to. 
So, yes, you've seen all of the, the things that have been done. And so, basically, in going through this process, uh, what I've done is I've looked at the way sub-volumes uh, are provided and the functionality associated with them on copy-on-write file systems and looked at the way we can provide that same functionality without having to implement copy-on-write metadata. And really, the underlying revelation that led to all of this was that if we present files as subvolumes and treat subvolumes as file systems, we get all of the same functionality as a copy on write file system out of an old dog. <laughs> it's got a new trick and it looks like it's going to work. So, thank you all for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We're actually just about out of time for questions. We'll just take one from Keith. I'll repeat the question. When do we get rid of the block driver and just have file systems everywhere? <laughs> so the question is, when do we get rid of the block driver and just have file systems everywhere? Um, I, I think that we've got it. We're, we're never going to get rid of the block device layer because we have things called legacy file systems. <laughs> we can emulate it on top of your new file system. <laughs> well, okay. yes, you probably could, but you know, we could emulate it on top of the new you know, sub-volume mechanisms. So, and you, yeah, we probably could, but we're not going to do that. Yet. Anyway, we really are out of yep. time. So thank you very much, thank Dave. You.